Hi folks, it's Sarah here and on the back of the previous video I thought I'd just delve a little bit more into metabolism, what it is and how weight loss is affected by metabolism and, and sort of how sometimes on a diet you don't necessarily lose as much as you think you ought to if you just looked at the, the raw numbers. Most bodybuilders know that when, when you're on a long-term cutting phase, uh, that's what it's known as, you often have to, particularly for the for the harder categories like the men and the categories I do, which is figure and physique, where I have to get ex extremely lean, you actually have to implement strategies to keep the, the, the weight loss going. And that can include taking mini breaks, um, what's known as refeed meals. You know, on a regular basis, you bump up the calories to uh, convince your, your body that the world isn't ending, you know, everything's actually fine. Other, You can cycle macros as well. So there's a number of strategies that are fairly common in the in the bodybuilding world. I was just looking, reading this study. I, I'll have curiosity, so I'll de I delve into studies all over the place. And there's been a very recent study here in the International Journal of Obesity that showed how obese men, when they did periodic weight loss phases interspersed with a, a normal calorie phase, they actually lost more weight over a longer period of time. And you can see here, I've, I've just done up a little chart of my, of this year, how I've managed to, how I did this year, because I had, because my whole year over the 11 months was kind of split into three seasons. In order to uh, stay looking like this for nine months, I've had to implement mini breaks. So my first phase up to June was 24 weeks, as you can see, my starting weight was 62. And this seems to be the way that my body likes to sit at, ended up at 52.5. Now, at that point, I was stoked at 52. This is me at 52.5 kilos. I thought that this, this is actually the best condition I've ever brought to stage. And I thought that was quite amazing because it was a whole kilo lighter than what I competed at last year. Having done that, then because I had from June to September, there was a period of 15 weeks, I was able to actually take four weeks off my break, off my preparation restrictions. Yes, I did put on a little bit of weight, but not much, you know, half a kilo a week, okay. And then I tightened it up again for the July to September phase, and that was 11 weeks. And actually, I came in a whole kilogram lighter, which really surprised me, because that, in the five years that I've been doing this and supposedly been putting on muscle, this was the same way that I competed in my very first year. So that kind of surprised me a bit. Also a little bit concerning because it sort of indicated that potentially I've lost muscle. Yes, I looked absolutely phenomenal. I was definitely leaner than my novice year, but to come in at the same weight as my novice year when in theory I was supposed to have put on four or five kilos of muscle kind of indicated that potentially I might actually have lost muscle during this phase. I did actually have to be much more on top of it for this this middle break than the first part part and I actually will show you the video of this I had a whole week in South Africa on a business conference where I, I had no gym because there was lots of delicious food around and I've done a video which I will put up about how you can manage events going away traveling while you're trying to look after yourself this July September one I was much I was much more on the ball and I came in a bit tighter and then because I had 10 weeks between September and my November shows, I did allow myself just to relax for a week before I tightened up again for my, my absolute critical shows, which were in Los, Los Angeles and Las Vegas. So those were my main shows of the year, and I really wanted to be absolutely spot on. But what was interesting, from this September to November one, although I had less weight to lose, I actually had to work an awful lot harder this time round to maintain my condition. I actually had to reduce my food more than I had done for the whole of the rest of the year. And that, to me, was a bit of a red flag and kind of indicated that potentially my metabolism had downregulated a bit more than I wanted it to. This is, this is why I'm thinking that in this eight weeks, you know, like I say, I've put on nine kilos in eight weeks. And it got me thinking, is my metabolism downregulated more than I expected? Have I been more lax than I usually am post-competition? Have I rebounded badly compared to previous previous years? And, and then I just got thinking, then I just got really curious about metabolic adaptations on dieting. So like I say, this is how I, what I looked like for nine months a year. And this is, this is why now that I look like this, you can kind of see why it's sort of a bit messing with my head. And, and I'm starting to wonder if, if I've kind of 
overshot the, the weight regain. But let's just first dive into um, some definitions. You know, what is diet? You can see here that the sort of dry scientific version is that it's the foods that a person, animal or community habitually eats. It's to do with the absorption of vitamin, vitamins, minerals and fats from protein. Then you have a diet, which is where you restrict yourself to specific foods or calories, or, you know, for a particular reason and for to achieve a particular goal. Then again, diet can also, in marketing terms, can also mean pretty much a lower calorie content of the, than another product that has not been modified. So that's a fairly dry definition of what diet is. I thought now I'd just go into metabolism and what metabolism is. Over the course of a day, the amount of energy you burn is determined by four particular factors. There's what's known as your resting metabolic rate. Now, this is this is basically how much energy you burn if you sit on a couch all day and breathe and do nothing else. And that accounts for about 55% of the amount of energy that you burn. So this is basically your heart beating, your brain working, your organs doing what they need to do. You, that is what comprises most of the energy that you use, just your body being itself. The types of food you eat also contribute to how much energy that you burn as well. This is where often when you're you're trying to sort of lose weight and you need to look at the types of foods you eat because certain sorts of foods will take more energy to digest than others. Protein particularly is harder to digest than refined carbohydrates, for example. So if you just ate 100 grams of chicken, or you ate 100 grams of rice, you would burn more energy eating that 100 grams of chicken than you would do the 100 grams of rice because the rice is easier for your body to digest and the protein is much harder for your body to break down. So when you're trying to lose weight, the, the kind of foods you eat can actually contribute sort of between 10 and 15% of the amount of energy that you burn during the day. Of course, you've got your exercise-related energy. Um, we all know that the combination of restricted calories and exercise can help you lose weight. And then you've got this big bit here, which is NEAT. And this is your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So this is how much energy you use in your day-to-day -day activities. It might be you know, walking to work, walking around the office, or doing the housework, looking after the kids. Whatever it is, this counts as NEAT. Sometimes this factor here, NEAT, is the difference between one person losing a lot more weight than another because the one person that loses the more weight often they're just much more active in their day-to-day -day life you know they're less sedentary they might you know if they work in an office they might have a standing up desk as opposed to a chair any way you can look at building in extra sort of activity during your day can help you burn off excess extra energy now when you're on a diet often you'll start off you'll lose a heap of weight and then you'll probably reach a plateau and this is when you need to start implementing strategies that can keep the weight loss going. The reason for this is because your body adapts. Uh, your body is the best adapting machine going. It tries to maintain what's known as homeostasis. It doesn't like change. So when you do something drastic like go on a diet, it freaks your body out kind of thing. And it then tries to catch up and adapt to what you're doing. And there are several ways in which you can do this. The first of this is your mitochondrial efficiency is increased. Now, what, what is that? Well, mitochondria are the power cells of your body. They're what takes the calories that you intake in the, term, in, in the form of food and they turn it into energy to do stuff. So let's say, for example, that an activity that you did before you went on a diet, you would burn 100 calories. After eight weeks or 12 weeks of the diet, you might only be burning 80 calories because you've become more efficient at doing the same amount of work. And you saw from the previous thing how big a part of your daily calorie, <coughs> excuse me, expenditure your NEAT was. When you become more efficient at doing stuff, your NEAT decreases. Now, let's get on to hormones. These are very, very important in terms of your thermogenesis. Now, uh, thyroid is the daddy of your meta metabolic hormones. If your thyroid is too active, hyperthyroidism, you'll probably find that you lose weight too quickly. If your thyroid is underactive, you might gain weight and not be able to lose it. So you really want your thyroid to be just right. Because I'm so in tune with my body, 
some of these hormonal adaptions, I'll, I'll describe what they actually feel like because I, I believe that I can actually feel them because, like I say, because, because I've been doing this for such a long time now, I'm so in tune with my body, I can actually feel them. And last year, I did actually burn myself out very, very severely and I did cause my thyroid to become underactive. So for most of this year, actually for the first sort of nine months of this year, I've actually been on thyroid medication. And this could actually explain also why the last part of my competition phase, I had to work so hard in terms of dropping my diet and increasing exercise because I wasn't on this thyroid support. So potentially my thyroid was still a little underactive. A, a symptom of that is, is chronic fatigue. And even now that I'm off competition and I really have pulled back on the training, you know, I can sleep for sort of 10 hours a, a, a night and wake up still feeling like I need another four or five hours of sleep. So potentially my thyroid is still a little bit underactive. So I, I actually do need to get that tested. Your satiety de decreases. Leptin is uh, leptin and insulin are both hormones that are secreted by your, your body to tell you that you're full. Leptin is also impacted by the level of fat you're carrying. Now, here's the thing. You might wonder that if leptin and insulin are impacted by the amount of fat you've got on you, in other words, the more fat you have, the more it produces, how can people get a beat? Surely it would, these hormones would be telling your brain that they're full and they should stop eating. Well, this is the problem with them. Your brain can actually basically become immune to them. You know, it tunes out and goes, not, not listening, not listening, not listening, can't hear you. Ghrelin is the opposite of leptin and it is secreted by your body in response to the size of your stomach, essentially. As your stomach shrinks, the longer you, it is since you had a last meal, your body starts to increase the amount of ghrelin that you produce. The converse of that, of course, is as your stomach expands when you eat, ghrelin production decreases and the leptin and insulin production increases, which is how your brain knows that, that it's full. The trouble is your brain does not get resistant to ghrelin, and this is probably a, a survival mechanism. You can become resistant to the signal, the I'm full signal produced by leptin and insulin, but your body does not get immune or resistant to the signal produced by ghrelin. When I come off competition, the first four weeks is probably the most difficult because even though I'm back to eating my normal food, I never have the feeling of being full. And it only lasts about four weeks, but in that four weeks, it's very, very difficult and you have to exert probably even more discipline and even more control over what you eat because you just never seem to get this sensation of being full because at that point you know I have no body fat on me so my my production of leptin is, is significantly reduced so my, my brain doesn't know that I'm full conversely of course you know I'm still getting all of the I'm hungry signals from all of the ghrelin so it becomes very difficult and you can start to see actually why people who have gone on very extreme diets rebound so badly. They've lost the fat so they're not producing the, the leptin which tells your brain it's full but you sure as hell are cranking out the grey limbs so and going I'm hungry and it becomes this is why diets become increasingly harder to maintain as you go along because these three key hormones the longer you go on potentially the, the greater adapt adaptation you have. This ad adaptation has been identified as far back as, as 1984. Another factor with it, it, it does seem to, you know, the more you diet and go up and down, then the more the this adaptation seems to come on more rapidly and be stronger as well. So how long does it actually take for it to kick in? Well, there was one study that I read and it showed that after 10 days, a study on obese individuals, their metabolism had downregulated by 6% 6, 6 within 10 days. And then there was this other study done at the University of Paris, and they had a very bizarre diet, these people. It was eight obese women, and they had the bizarrest of diets. So there was a 93% protein, 4% fat, and a 0.2% carb diet, which is very, very extreme anyway. But they found that by 20, 21 days, their me metabolic rate had downregulated by 18%, which is which is very significant if you think about it. So then the next question is, how long does it last? Because most research does show that uh, the adaptive thermogenesis and decreased energy expenditure does persist after um, your active weight loss. It's been shown to continue even, even with people who've lost more than 10% of their body weight, even beyond a year, their bodies are still downregulated. And there was this fascinating study done by the University of California 
and they had a group of people in a biosphere for two years. They were on a mainly plant-based diet, so it was about 80% carbohydrate diet, so totally opposite to the Paris study, actually. 80% carbohydrate diet, mainly plant-based. And after two years, these people left the biosphere, returned to their normal, their normal life, and they were measured six months later. And their metabolisms were still downregulated six months later you know, after returning to their normal life. And then we get to this fascinating study on the biggest losers. At the end of the 30-week competition, the, the average weight loss was 53 kilos, which is amazing. It's a life-changing, it is a life-changing weight loss. But the average decrease in their resting metabolic rate, now get that, remember, this is the rate that when you're just sitting on the couch, doing absolutely nothing, you're just breathing and just being. So on average, they were burning 610 cal calories less at the end of the 30 weeks than they were before. If you're trying to maintain your weight, you've got to eat. That's actually still quite a lot of food that you have to eat less. And one poor soul was burning up over 1,000 calories less after the 30 weeks of competition. So you can imagine how hard that is to maintain. And sure enough, after six years, not only had they regained the vast majority of the weight, I mean, I do feel, you know, somebody who regained 72 kilos can you know that's 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 desperately tragic actually uh, so you do you do feel sorry for these people what's worse is they were still their metabolisms were still down regulated very significantly so given all of that i then wondered how does that apply to me First of all, what I did is there's a number of calculators online that will tell you how much your base metabolic rate is, which is the same as your resting metabolic rate, how much you need to eat to maintain your weight, how much you need to lose half a kilo, and how much you need to gain half a kilo. So I ran my height, weight, activity levels through all of the calculators and came up with an average. So in theory, if I hadn't done any competing this year or ever I had never lost any you know hadn't been obese at any point in time then for my age and height and weight and activity level then my maintenance level of calories is this if I wanted to lose half a kilo I needed to drop to this and if I want to gain I needed to eat this okay so then I plugged it in with where I actually was so if I wanted to maintain over eight weeks this is how many calories I would need to eat and to gain half a kilo a week, the difference became an extra 30,800 calories. And that would just be to gain four kilos. Now, half a, half a kilo gain or loss is considered to be acceptable and sustainable in any way. But what actually happened is, as you can see, I've gained nine kilos. Either I've eaten one hell of a lot more food than even I thought I was eating or there's potentially something else going on. So then I just worked out what, how much of an excess factor this weight gain is over what I would have expected to have gained. And it equates to an absolutely mammoth 182,000 plus calories extra over, over the maintenance level, which equates to about 3,262 calories a day. So you can see that in theory, I've been eating you know, 1,200 calories a day extra for the last eight weeks to gain all of this weight. Now, I know for a fact that that is actually not true. You know, in the last three weeks, I have very deliberately and specifically got back onto routine. I've set, I set my food level kind of at somewhere that was about halfway between where I started my competition preparation at and where I finished my competition preparation at. It was probably a little bit, it was probably a little bit closer to this where I was at the start, but it definitely was not this level of calories. You know, that kind of blows me away. Now, what factors could have played into this? Well, you know, I had a week's holiday, so I, I did exercise three or four times while I was there, but of course, not as intense, you know, it wasn't the seven times a week, it didn't have the high intensity stuff that I'd been doing up to that point. So yes, um, although I did exercise and I guess three of the five days were fairly sensible, I definitely did have a couple of days where I ate a bit more than usual and uh, had some, a couple of things to drink and the exercise had backed off. So that could be a factor. Then I have had actually, actually had two weeks of training. So yes, my whole exercise level has gone down significantly from where I was before, which sort of implies that, you know, that section of uh, the, was the exercise calories has, is 
probably playing a significant factor here. In addition to that, you know, with Christmas and New Year, there have been, I think I've probably been out for about six six nights out with alcohol and a Christmas party was a very huge night. And alcohol actually is the granddaddy of fat loss killers. So yes, I, I could see where some of this has come from, but I don't think it equates to the whole the whole thing. So then I thought, well, let's relate it back to you know, all of these studies that we've talked to. Now we know from all of these other studies that down regulation of your resting metabolic rate can be up to 18% within 21 days. So potentially this value here was reduced by 18% within the first 21 days of me starting my competition preparation back in January. Then you've got these other ones here that you know between 10 and 20%, 5 to 15%, and then you've got the biggest loser here. Now, I was dieting for 45 weeks, not 30 weeks. So if this 610 calories re- represents base, you know, your resting metabolic rate decrease after 30 weeks, potentially what was that like after 45 weeks? Now, so then what I did is I I took all of those down regulation values and calculated what my new resting metabolic rate is, potentially could be, and what my new maintenance level potentially could be. We know from the California study that metabolic rate was still decreased in those study uh, participants even six months later. And we know from the biggest loser one that, you know, their metabolic rate was downregulated still six years later. Now, I am both coming off an extended period of caloric restriction and we know from these other studies that reduced obese people experience a permanent downregulation of their metabolic rate. I've got kind of a double whammy going on here. You know, I have sort of been prone to putting on fat when I've, you know, over the years. And that's because I'm a reduced obese person. On top of that, I've got the the adaptations from 45 weeks of caloric restriction. So potentially, if we took my new resting metabolic rate, my base metabolic rate as here, then you can see how even if I was only eating at what my predicted maintenance for my age weight and activity level is, which is here, then you can see there's nearly a thousand calories, well there's just over a thousand calories of difference, which kind of explains how when I've got 1200 calories excess here and hence gaining over a kilo a week, you you can sort of see how although I may not have been actually eating this amount of food, because my whole metabolic rate is down here, then if I was eating at my normal level of food, it represents the same difference. So you can start to see now why my body has been absolutely primed for for fat gain. And even though I've made the specific effort to control it for the last three weeks, the weight has still been creeping on. I think it's, you know, it's potentially because my my metabolic rate has, has downregulated so much. Look, this I, I find this utterly fascinating, and this is kind of also why I want to do this this experiment, if you like, because I, I'd actually be curious to find out where my my body actually is sitting right now. So what I'm going to do to baseline it is, and I'll show you how to do this later, is I'm going to start at a at a very sort of conservative baseline, and then I'm going to either build up, you know, I'm going to watch what happens. And then I'm going to either build up or decrease again from that baseline. So look, I hope that's going to be helpful. So stay tuned and I'll talk to you next time.